Hello everyone, my name is Professor Lorna Dugan and I'm from the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Leeds. I've been in the school for 10 years and I came to the school because I could see that it was a really friendly school doing great research and where research was really integral to the teaching that took place there. I'm now the Director of Research and Innovation in the school and so um, that's a great way to find out about research all, ac all across the school. But today I'd like to talk to you about the research that we do in my own group. And um, here is a picture of my group. Um, and we're on the campus here in the autumn and you can see the fallen leaves uh, on, on the ground. Um, our, our research is funded by the National and European Research Councils, as well as by the European, um, as well as the Institute of Physics. And you can find out more about the research that we do at our uh, website. Um, and we're also on social media where you can get the latest news on the papers that we're publishing and where we're presenting our work. Um, so please do check that out if you're interested. Today I'd like to tell you about the new approaches that we're taking to understand mechanics and materials. And we're going to be looking at molecules, single molecules. We're going to look at the networks that form uh, from those molecules. And then by putting that information together, we're going to learn about the applications that might be realized through understanding of the physics. So we're considering this subject of hierarchical biomechanics and what does that mean? So let me show you an example to try to illustrate. So this is a movie of the human body and we're going to zoom in on a single blood cell. And that blood cell has a, a wall, a, a membrane, and that membrane, if we zoom in again, we can look at the details of the structure that is forming the cell wall. So you can see that it's made up of fibers and these fibers take a particular orientation and this is collagen and collagen is amazing because it can withstand gigapascals of pressure so what is it made of let's look in a bit more detail and you can see these fibers which have this staggered architecture and within that if we go to the next length scale we can see these nanometer sized aligned molecules and within that we can go to the next level of detail and see that each of these tropocollagen fibers is made up of this helical bundle. So isn't, isn't this amazing? We've got all of these structures of these different length scales and mechanics is important to every single one of them. So let's think about the mechanics on a spring. Here you can see an image of a spring and when a force is applied to it, it is extended. And Hooke's law describes the relationship between the force and the extension through a proportionality constant called the spring constant. But let's think about what that might mean in the context of something on a different length scale. So the spring might be somewhere in between the pencil tip and the tennis ball. So what if we want to go to length scales which are much smaller to the left? and think about things on the nanometer length scale. So we want to look at nanoscale biomolecules. How are we going to go about doing that? Uh, so we've got a special instrument to do that. Uh, and the instrument is called the Atomic Force Microscope. And it was created in the 80s by two scientists, Gerd Binning and Henrik Rohr, uh, who went on to win the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1986 for the scanning tunneling microscope. So here's a little cartoon that we made uh, of the atomic force microscope and it's got a couple of really important components that I'll talk you through. It's got this cantilever tip that sticks out uh, and it's got a sharp tip at the end of that and we can use that to uh, uh, pick something up from a surface. So the surface is underneath, it's a gold coated surface which is resting on top of a piezoelectric device. A piezoelectric device can be controlled with electronics to either um, compress or elongate the position. So this allows you to have nanometer control over the position of your surface. So imagine we've put something onto that surface, we bring the surface up towards the tip, we pick something up, we bring the surface away and we start to elongate that molecule. And if we elongate it to a particular distance, um, we can start to apply a force to that molecule and the cantilever will start to bend. 
And we can measure that deflection because we've got a laser positioned onto the upper side of the cantilever. And that deflection can be measured with this four quadrant diode that you can see in the corner. So that's a very quick introduction to the technique. Um, let me show you a video. And this video was made by a project student um, in the school, Jamie Ridley, and it really gets across the main idea of, of the AFM. So let me let me show you the video. So we're zooming in uh, to the molecule. In this case, it's a protein, and we've got the main components of the atomic force microscope, the laser being emitted onto the upper side of the cantilever so that we can monitor the position of the cantilever. We're bringing the surface and tip into contact. That's allowing us to pick something up at either end. The force is being applied. Lovely. So what you can see on the right hand side is a, a real experimental trace. Um, and if I go to the next slide, you'll be able to see a little schematic of that trace. So here you can see the force extension trace and it looks like a sawtooth pattern. And each of the little teeth corresponds to one of the molecules in the chain unraveling. And we can get some interesting information from this. We can get the force that was needed to unfold that molecule and we can get the length extension that occurs when the molecule has unfolded. And there's lots of really interesting physics in here. What you might notice is that the force extension is not a diagonal line as it would be if the molecule behaved as a spring. Instead, we've got this curvature and that curvature can be described by something like the worm-like chain model. And what it considers is the force that is competing with the entropic tendency of that polymer, of that chain to stay crumpled up. When it's crumpled up, it can take lots of different conformations, so its disorder is maximized. And so you've got that competition between the force and the entropy, and when the force wins, it unfolds. So there's lots of interesting parameters in this model. I want to highlight one of them, and that's LP, and that's the persistence length of the molecule and it gives you a measure of the flexibility and you'll hear a little bit more about that in a few slides. This approach is really powerful because it allows us to measure forces on the picronewton length scale, that's times 10 to the minus 12, and it allows us to look at lengths on the nanometer length scale times 10 to the minus 9. And in addition to that, it allows us to look in more detail at things such as this entropic elasticity molecular reorganization, bond angle deformation, and even the rupture of strong covalent bonds. And you can see here, we're working right at the boundary of thermal noise. Thermal noise is KT, and that is 4.1 piconewton nanometers. So this is really incredible that this instrument gives us the sensitivity to do that. So for example, we can use this to look at the importance of hydrogen bonds in a molecule. Now hydrogen bonds are uh, relatively weak, but there are many of them in biological molecules. And in a project, um, Megan Hughes, a bachelor's project student in the group, examined this in a little bit more detail. So she looked at the importance of the orientation of hydrogen bonds and the direction of the applied force. And this is a little bit like Velcro. So if you imagine trying to pull Velcro apart uh, this way, it's very difficult, it's very strong. But if you unpeel it, then you can unzip the Velcro um, one by one um, and it's easy to unravel. And it's the same for these molecules at the nanometer length scale where you've got two surfaces, the hydrogen bonds can be unzipped or pop up, popped open one by one. And in the lower example, the hydrogen bonds need to be sheared simultaneously to break. So you've got this mechanical hierarchy in these molecules at this hydrogen bond level. So that was an example of a molecule and a force being applied to the molecule, but let's try to make it a little bit more complicated. And to help you visualize that, what you can see here is a two dimensional grid where we've put a series of springs going vertically and horizontally. And if we put weights on either end of this platform or this grid, we can apply a force to that system and now we can start to ask questions about what force is needed if the springs are connected in this particular orientation. 
And again, for some of you, you might be familiar with some of the concepts of springs in series and springs in parallel. And what happens to the spring constants when you add them in those two different ways? So this allows us to go up in a, a level of complexity to think about this in a 2D system. And this was a grid that we actually made to explore this concept. It was made by Ben Hansen in the group. And you can see all of the components that he made to use it. And, and we published this work this year in the Institute of Physics journal, Physics Education. So this was a lot of fun, um, but it also allowed us to really explore the complexity of this problem of spring, springs connecting in different ways. And we brought this activity to uh, an event that is run at the University of Leeds called Be Curious. This is, this is a wonderful festival um, that takes place at the university um, where people, uh, the public can come in and find out more about the research that we do. And we always have lots of things there from the School of Physics and Astronomy. And in these two pictures from the day last year, uh, you can see Ben. Ben is the person standing next to, where am I? <laughs> No, this way. Uh, ben is the person at the table um, uh, looking down on this grid and we've set up quite a complicated uh, two dimensional grid of springs and series in parallel. We're trying to figure out what force is going to be applied and what extension will result from that network of springs. And then up above me, you can see another type of network. Um, so this is making a network using molecules connected in a particular way and in an aqueous solution in a water-based solution. And you might otherwise know this as slime. So slime is a network of polymers. So let's take a closer look at that. So in this simulation box, you can see lots of different molecules which are um, connected together. Uh, we've removed the water from this simulation so you can see it a little more clearly. But we've got a lot of different molecules and they're moving about due to thermal motion. And some of them are able to connect with each other, some of them are not able to connect, and in time a structure will form. And what we're interested in understanding is how the mechanics, the mechanical properties of those single molecules, how does that translate when it is in a network like this? And how can we possibly answer that question? Now it turns out this is one of the biggest challenges in the field that we work in, and that's the field of biophysics and soft matter physics. So how can we translate the physics that we can use to describe one lens scale to the next lens scale up, the meso or the macroscopic lens scale? So I just want to share some things that we've been doing to try to address that. So this is Ben that I mentioned earlier. Ben has developed a modeling platform called BioNet that allows us to look at network formation. So we do this in a number of ways. We can look at how sticky our molecules are by controlling the number of connections on the surface, the little gray dots. We can control the rate at which the network forms. We can allow it to cross-link and connect very quickly or much slower and look at the resulting structure and the mechanics of that structure. And then we can think about the flexibility of the molecules, the building blocks. We can make them very floppy or we can make them very rigid. And that's by changing the persistence length. And remember, you saw that when we looked at the force extension traces. So the flexibility of that polymer is really important in determining the network formation. We can also look at the rate of network growth. And in these simulations, student Khalila Cook is looking at the structures that form when the network grows quickly or when it grows more slowly. And again, we want to understand how that resulting structure has differing mechanics. And you can see some of those in the next slide. Um, so here, this is a molecule that we've been working with. It's a, a protein, a biological nano machine. And that little floating head has, has popped up early. Um, that uh, is Andrew Hare. So Andrew was uh, an MPhys project student in the group last week that, that, that started this project. So what Andrew did was he, he took this molecule, he um, added it, lots of it to a solution, and he triggered a reaction that would allow the molecule to stick together. This is a photoactivated chemical reaction to make this network. The network is in water and it's called a hydrogel. So the main component is water with this polymer network forming. 
And so we were interested in the structure that these molecules um, would take. We did some scattering experiments to do that. We've not got time to talk about that today, but I wanted to focus on the mechanics. So um, Andrew was able to do um, experiments called rheology, looking at the flow of gels using a rheometer. And you can see an image of that instrument just up above. Um, so a rheometer has this oscillating plate. We're able to put our sample uh, onto the instrument. And then underneath, we've got this LED element that switches on and initiates this cross-linking. So we made this add-on device in the department, and we've got a really fantastic um, technical and mechanical workshop team that really add to all of the, the research that we do in the department. We're really lucky. So using this instrument, um, Andrew was able to apply um, shear forces to the gel and then determine the response of the gel to those forces. So with this, we can start to ask questions about the mechanics of our building blocks, the little bio nano machines, and their impact on the final gel structure that forms. And we're feeding in all the information that we have from the modeling to design these gels. OK, so this was the slide that I showed you at the start. And what I've tried to do is, is give you an idea of the experiments and approaches we're using to look at single molecules. Why we're using that to feed through to the next lens scale, which is the network of these structures. And we're, we're doing this because actually we're really interested in the physics that underlines these processes. But in addition to that, what we learn from doing this can allow us to move towards new applications where we exploit these materials. And these biological materials, these bio nano machines, are really special because they don't just have structure and structure and mechanics but they have function, they do jobs in our bodies. So they provide really tremendous inspiration for making new materials. So the research that I've shown today takes place in the School of Physics and Astronomy. But because of the nature of what we do, we also collaborate with people outside of the school in biological sciences, in engineering and medicine and the hospitals. And that's through these interdisciplinary centers such as the Asprey Center and the Bragg Center for Materials Research. So I just wanted to share a couple of examples of what we do. So let's think about this. Imagine you, you hurt yourself and you put a plaster on your hand and that plaster has a couple of purposes. It might, you might want it to protect the wound and you might want it to do more than that. And actually it would be great if it could do more than that because wound treatment, for example, in the UK, uh, the National Health Service cost for wound heating is five billion a year. And one of the problems is the risk of reinfection. Um, so wouldn't it be great if we could use some of our knowledge of the physics to feed into this problem? And wouldn't it be great if we could use building blocks that could make networks that would allow us to make materials which were dynamic and responsive and had diverse biological functionality? So really pioneering methods are urgently, urgently needed and research in the School of Physics and Astronomy is addressing this problem. So let me give you an example. What you can see in this schematic is a micrometer size bubble. And inside the bubble, we have a gel scaffold, which has a particular structure and mechanics. And inside that scaffold, we can load drug molecules, which are shown in red. What we can then do is add bubbles inside the scaffold and we can use ultrasound to pop the bubble and to allow the release of the drug. This is really exciting because it's allowing PhD student Krista Brown to work towards targeted drug delivery with controlled release. And this is a wonderful collaboration with colleagues within the school and the medicine school at the university. So let me show you a movie from Krista's research that is, that is really exciting. So what you can see here is the formation of these micro bubbles. And so you have the oil and the aqueous phase coming together in channels to then produce a bubble of a particular size. And inside that bubble, we've got the molecules that we need to later cross link and form the gel. So this is a really exciting time and this is a collaboration between uh, us in the School of Physics and Astronomy and people in the School of Medicine. So we can't wait to see where this project goes next. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I've really loved sharing some of our research with you. 
And I hope in future I get the opportunity to see some of you and perhaps some of you will join the lab to help us continue this research. Uh, if you'd like to know more, you can check out, check out the links below. Um, but thank you for listening.